Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Dr. Konrad Elst. I am an Orientalist, that is to say a scholar of Oriental philology and history. That is the official title for a word that has been much maligned in academe recently. Anyway, the part of history that I have now focused on is one that ought to be of great interest all across the political spectrum namely about the motives behind Mahatma Gandhi's murder. Mahatma Gandhi is being invoked time and again by politicians in India, both of the governing party and of the opposition. And yet, even though there are by now thousands of publications on Gandhi, not one of them focuses on the why of his assassination. There are a few books about the intrigue behind the how of his assassination. And then there are thousands of, of, of do-gooder books about Gandhism. But the reason why he was assassinated is somehow never discussed. So that is what I've been trying to do now. Mahatma Gandhi belonged to the uh, Gujarati Banya caste, the trader caste which is why it is very fitting that his picture now adorns the currency notes in India. His father was a minister in a princely state, a prime minister even, and a devotee of an extremely non-violent Vaishnava or Vishnuite sect. So his uh, penchant for non-violence had already been instilled in him since childhood. He married at 14 and had four sons. Even after marrying, he was sent to England to study law. He became a lawyer and as such, he took service with a Muslim Indian trader in South Africa. His uh, sexual prudishness, which was in itself not uncommon, was aggravated by guilt over intercourse with his wife during the very moment when his father breathed his last. Perhaps this was a factor in his decision later on for sexual abstinence. The remarkable thing about it is that he made this decision without consulting his wife. He simply imposed it on her. Much later, he refused his wife modern medicine when she was gravely ill, as a consequence of which she died. He refused modern education to his sons, though he himself had availed of all the opportunities thereof. He also blocked his son's marriage, which was going to be an intercaste marriage, with another leader of the Indian Freedom Movement, Rajaji or Raja Gopalachari. It would have been an intercaste marriage since uh, he was a Banya and she a Brahmin. That may have something to do with it. It is only after some five years that he gave up uh, his uh, objections. Most controversial thing about Gandhi's family life is that when he was a widower in his last years, he shared his bed with young girls, supposedly to test his chastity. This is somewhat bizarre. You see, numerous men have been celibate all their lives. I mean, you hear of a few cases of Catholic priests uh, sinning against their vow of celibacy. But majority of cases, or at any rate, very, very many cases, were simply loyal to their oath of celibacy. Among married men, numerous millions have been faithful to their wives all their life long and have never made any song about it. And yet Gandhi had to make a big show of it. 
So I wonder if this is saintly. You see, many people in India didn't think so. And because that was easy to foresee, most of his uh, associates avoided the subject and kept silence about it. Later on, it has been studied. And so it is a bit controversial. But since Gandhi is used as a trump card against the Hindu nationalists, he is taken into protection by the enemies of the Hindu nationalists. And therefore, the media don't really write about this controversial aspect of his career. While still in South Africa, he wrote an autobiography, The Story of My Experiments with Truth, which is mainly about his career in South Africa, where he tried out the strategy of nonviolence in the service of his political agitation. Now, that political agitation was rather limited in scope. The Indian community in South Africa was small and fairly unimportant. Economically fairly important, but politically not at all. It was not the ruling community, which was the British. It was not the local nor the majority community, which were the Africans. And so the stakes of their agitation were not very high. In the famous uh, Attenborough movie about Gandhi's life, you see this um, non-violent agitation in the service of a political goal, namely to restore the legality of Hindu and Muslim marriages. You see some overzealous um, British mission-minded uh, administrator had decided that all weddings except Christian ones would be unlawful. And so, you see, Gandhi agitated against this, and ultimately the British took it back. They again allowed uh, Hindu and Muslim marriages. Now, that's nice that his agitation was successful, but ultimately it was about very little. You see, the British didn't give him any power by conceding this point. It really made no difference for them, and so some administrators thought, well, this was perhaps a bit overzealous. Let's drop this. Let's continue governing at ease. Whereas in India, the stakes would be much higher. It would be about a big empire, hundreds of millions of people, and full independence, making a really big dent in the structure of the British Empire. So in fact, the, the limited successes of the nonviolent strategy were not so representative of Gandhi's whole career. At that time already, and that point is, uh, is discussed much in his experiments with truth, uh, he was already pro, um, well, still pro-caste, in fact, but practically speaking, very anti-caste discrimination, anti-untouchability. So that is given a lot of attention. That has been much talked about. We will uh, skip that for the rest. An important point in that book also is that he is clearly against British culture and pro Swadeshi. And he insists that Indians should not give in to the temptation of selling out their own culture and adopting the Western model. As you may know, uh, a famous uh, statement by his he was asked, what do you think about the civilization of the West? And he answered, hey, that would be a good idea. And that is somewhat the spirit of that book, of the uh, Swadeshi, you know, the, uh, the national, the uh, son of the soil kind of approach to civilization. And yet, all through, he was pro the British Empire was very loyal to the British Empire. He actively served in or recruited for the Boer War, the Zulu War, and World War I. He actively recruited for World War I, which was a senseless mass killing. At that time, the biggest uh, massacre that had ever taken place in human history. 
but the apostle of nonviolence recruited for that war. Al-Fandi was also anti-anti-Islam, an opinion that has remained dominant among Hindus ever since. That is to say, he, uh, he realized the existence of criticism of Islam, but he opposed it. He said that all religions essentially teach the same thing. In 1916, he returned to India uh, when he went to enroll his children in a school. Um, the principal, Swami Shradhananda, uh, addressed him as Mahatma. And ever since, he has continued to be known as such. Some also give the honor of giving him that, that uh, nickname to uh, Tagore, the poet. But for my information, it was Swami Shradhananda. Anyway, the point is not so important. In 1920, he succeeded Bala Gangadhara Tilak as Congress president. Uh, Tilak had been a staunch uh, nationalist. He had uh, thought that uh, Swaraj, that autonomy, independence, is the birthright of the Indians. Gandhi didn't go that far. It is only in 1929 that Congress adopted the Purna Swaraj Resolution, the resolution for complete independence. Until then, they had been struggling for a kind of autonomy within the British Empire, a status comparable to Canada or Australia, you know, the sort of grown-up colonies as opposed to African colonies that were deemed, you know, too, too immature to ever rule themselves or to rule themselves at least at present. So he thought that Indians had to be treated as grown-ups, that they should have their autonomy, but all within the context of loyalty to the British Empire. Though he uh, remained uh, president only for a limited time, and even gave up his Congress membership after some years, he remained a towering influence within the Congress. Now, a point that has uh, strongly marked his further career is uh, the question of Hindu-Muslim relations. Congress was effectively a Hindu movement. Also some prominent Parsis, but it was boycotted by the Muslims and the Christians. They artificially tried to attract Muslims in order to boost their claim of representativity. They wanted to be seen as representing the whole Indian nation, and that would include the Muslims who were more than 20% and who could hardly be ignored. So some of the sponsors of the Congress even went as far as to bribe Muslims to take the train to wherever a Congress meeting was held and just make sure to be on the photographs to give an impression of a strong Muslim presence. But very soon, the um, involvement with Muslim causes would become far more serious, namely when the Khilafat movement started the British during the First World War had beaten the Caliph of Istanbul. This led to a revolution within Turkey with a secular state started by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And so the Caliph first became a, a pure figurehead without real power and ultimately he was deposed. Now, during this crisis of the caliphate, which is the formal uh, principle of sovereignty uh, within Islam, the Indian Muslims were very upset and they started a movement to restore the caliphate and to force the British to restore sovereignty over the Muslim sacred places, such as Mecca, to the caliph. Ultimately, the Congress had nothing to do with this campaign. You know, it was for a wholly different cause, 
than Indian independence. Yet Mahatma Gandhi decided to join this campaign and to put the Indian nationalist movement at the disposal of this pan-Islamic cause. This uh, movement led to some violence, as in Kerala, where there was a big concentration of Muslims, the Moplas. Uh, Hilafat uh, state was declared, and Hilafat militias went out to attack the British. But attacking the might of the British army was easy to say, but in practice it was much easier to train their guns on the neighboring Hindus who became the main uh, victims of Hilafat enthusiasm. And so Gandhi nevertheless started to justify and to whitewashing the behavior of the Moplas, and he only called off his agitation for a different reason. Namely, some of his Congress activists had become violent against the British. And he didn't want his own movement to be tainted with violence. So he called it off, but that means he called off his promised support to the Muslim agitation. So the Muslims were angry, and again a number of Hindus were killed. With that, the um, atmosphere of Hindu-Muslim tension increased and it um, became very clear also at other fronts. For example, there was a movement called the Arya Samaj, which uh, tried to restore Hinduism to its former glory by reconverting all the Muslims who had been forcibly converted in the past, converting them to their ancestral Hinduism, that is. In that context, some Arya Samaj intellectuals wrote polemical tracts against Islam. Now, fairly systematically, these were at one time or another neutralized by being killed. This led, for example, in 1897 already to the murder of Pandit Lala Lekram. But it was especially in Gandhi's time as Congress leaders that this process of killing uh, these uh, critics intensified. So there were a number of them between about 1915 and 1935. Perhaps the um, most spectacular one was the murder of Swami Shraddhananda, who was a very prominent leader. So he had welcomed the reconversion, the reconversion campaign, as well as the new idea of Hindu self-organization, Hindu Sangathan. He had welcomed these as what he called the savior of the dying race. You see, statistics showed that the percentage of Hindus was going down, 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 then as now. And so he thought that it was absolutely necessary to react to that, to stop the process of conversion to Islam or to Christianity, and to even reconvert those who had converted. And this could only be done if Hindus organized. So, you see, he's important in the genesis of the political Hindu movement. But he was also just practically uh, concerned with specific cases of reconversion. So he had taken a reconverted family under his wing and another relative reacted to that by uh, killing the Swami. The British reaction is also important till today because then they introduced the censorship law uh, 295A, which uh, forbids criticism of religion. Strictly speaking of any religion, they couldn't be too openly partisan for Islam, but effectively it was meant as a law to shield Islam from criticism. Now, about Gandhi, the, the strange thing with these murders is that generally he denounced the victims 
as being hateful and intolerant and so on because they had dared to criticize an idea, a belief system, and sympathized with the murderers. This had no political consequence, but it was noticed by people such as Naturam Gotze, who was later going to become the murderer of the Mahatma. This Arya Samaj movement was also a very important factor in the genesis of the first Hindu political party. In 1906, the All India Muslim League was created, the party that was later going to pioneer the creation of Pakistan. And that itself triggered the foundation, the counter foundation, so to speak, of a Hindu party, at least locally in the province of Punjab. And then later it was followed in uh, other provinces. So this was mostly by Arya Samaj, uh, leaders like Lala Lajpat Rai, Bhai Parmananda, and the already mentioned Swami Shradhananda. There was a false start of a pan-Indian uh, Hindu Mahasabha in 1915, but it really took off in 1922 as a reaction to the uh, heightened Hindu-Muslim tension, especially with the uh, Mopla rebellion. F first, the uh, Hindu Mahasabha existed as a kind of lobby group as a tendency within the Congress. So it, it could be emphasized perhaps now that the Hindu movement was always and entirely part of the freedom movement. There have recently been uh, sayings, uh, utterances by leftists to say that the uh, Hindu movement was in fact collaborationist with the British that it had nothing to do with the freedom movement. This is factually entirely untrue. However, in 1935, Congress uh, banished the Hindu Mahasabha. The members had to choose between remaining with Congress or becoming members of a separate party, Hindu Mahasabha. For example, Rajendra Prasad chose for Congress, uh, which was from a career viewpoint, a very good choice because soon after he became party president and later on in 1950, he became independent India's first president. So the rest um, uh, went on as a separate uh, independent political party and their goal was explicitly a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu state. In that same context, the RSS was created. RSS is Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangha, the National Volunteer Association. So in 1925, it started as a um, security service in the uh, national meeting of the Congress, which explains a lot of its um, imagery. You see, it's, it's quasi-military affectations, you know, its uniform. Uh, when you look at them walking on the street, you are reminded of Boy Scouts, and that is perhaps also their mentality ever since. It was founded by Kesha Bali Ram Hedgevar, who was a medical doctor, which is why he's called Dr. G. He had temporarily joined the Bengal revolutionaries. That also explains a lot about the RSS. I see the revolutionaries, of course, had to be very careful not to be caught by the police. So one thing they did was only to communicate orally. They would never commit any information to writing, as that could fall into the wrong hands. That culture has remained with the RSS for a very long time, and they shunned uh, modern communication and strictly communicated only by meeting in person. Anyway, important about the RSS here is that it chose to work apolitically, non-politically. You see, their um, starting point was that Hinduism has everything. As a civilization, it is a great success. You know, we can add little to it, but what it lacks is organization. And so 
the uh, RSS intended to provide organization. That is also why its English language weekly is called organizer. Had Guevara remained the head of the, um, the, 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 the chief guide, the head guide of the association till his death in 1940. But it is under his leadership that the RSS attracts a young boy called Naturam Gotze. And later on, his younger brothers also join. Naturam Gotze becomes a Baudic Pramuk, an uh, intellectual leader of the RSS. He is very active, he makes himself useful. For instance, by leading the agitation against the oppression of Hindus by the Nizam, the Muslim feudal ruler of Hyderabad. However, later on he quits the RSS. And that had nothing to do with any quarrel, neither a personal quarrel nor a political quarrel. You see, broadly, he remained loyal to the RSS. However, the RSS chose not to work in politics. And he wanted to do politics, he thought it was very important. He also had become enthusiastic for the leadership of the Hindu Mahasabha by uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, also known as Swatantri Avir, the hero of independence. He was party president in 1937 to 1943. However, his own loyalty to the RSS remained undiminished till the end, when in uh, 1949 he was taken to the gallows because he had received a death sentence after murdering Mahatma Gandhi, he sang an RSS song, which was just a nationalist song used by the RSS. And so, politically, there is not much wrong with it, but at any rate, it can be used to stamp him as an RSS man. So, formally, that is not correct. He was not an RSS man anymore. Ideologically, however, the lines are very blurred, and it is not overly wrong to call him an RSS man. So, Vir Savarkar uh, had uh, already a long record of uh, fighting for independence. In 1910, he had been arrested in uh, London, just, just after he had finished his law studies, uh, as an accomplice in a political murder. And he received for his complicity a sentence of transportation for life. He was locked up in the Andaman Penal Colony for 10 years till 1921. Then several more years in a prison on the mainland. And that is where in 1923 he wrote his famous ideological manifesto called Hindutva. So, According to him, a Hindu is he for whom India is both fatherland and holy land. So an Indian Muslim or an Indian Christian is not really part of the Hindu nation because even though India is his fatherland, it is not his holy land. Later on, he was released by the British on condition of abjuring any revolutionary idea. You see, this he did. It is sometimes criticized nowadays by leftists as a form of capitulation to the British. I think you could also call it uh, intelligent. You see, he simply weighed the pros and cons. And sitting in jail, he couldn't do much, whereas now, he has been a, an important political leader. And anyway, the situation had changed. You see, independence was already dimly on the horizon. Congress had already opted for Purna Swaraj, for full independence. So, you see, it would take some more struggle, but it was no longer a, a marriage. And so, in the, re, in the new situation, uh, Savarkar was clever, uh, of choosing 
to participate again in public life. In uh, 1937, he became party president of the Hindu Mahasabha, and as such, when World War II broke out, he offered the Viceroy his support. Uh, he himself was already too old to take service in the army, but he recruited among Hindus to take service and to get military experience. Because he calculated that with military experience, they would be a formidable force and probably they would even be able to make the British leave without any fight. Or if necessary, well, they would have to fight, but at least they would be far better prepared for it than they used to be. In fact, of the seven conspirators in the Mahatma Gandhi murder, three had served in the British Indian Army. Now, the thing on the horizon, apart from independence, was the partition of India. The Muslim League had never moved one finger for Indian independence, but as soon as it became plausible, they certainly wanted to have their part of it. Namely, they claimed a big part of India to create a separate Muslim state of Pakistan. In the 1930s, this idea was being voiced within the Muslim League. It was taken up famously by uh, the poet Muhammad Iqbal, who had formerly been a nationalist, who had even composed a song about the greatness of India that for a while was suggested as national anthem of the Indian Republic. But so then he uh, dropped this uh, pan-Indian nationalism and became the spiritual father of Pakistan. In 1940, the Muslim League passed the Pakistan Resolution. It was championed by Muslim League president and modernist Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the so-called Aligarh School. Aligarh was an Islamic academy founded uh, after the uh, rebellion or the, the, the mutiny, as it is called, of 1857, when temporarily the British looked very suspicious upon the Muslims. And so the more pro-British Muslims, pro-modern Muslims, founded this Aligarh School. By contrast, the idea of a separate state for Muslims was opposed by the orthodox so-called Deoband school, including the so-called nationalist Muslim Maulana Azad. Uh, as you know, Muslims within the Congress were greatly pampered. They badly wanted Muslims, particularly as very visible faces, to, to, to carry across the message that they represented everyone, including the Indian Muslims. And so one of them was Maulana Azad, who was clearly not a nationalist at all. During the um, Khilafat movement, he had explicitly been a Khilafatist. Muslim separatism, in fact, starts with Muhammad himself. He carried out the Hijra, the migration from Mecca to Medina, which marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar and which at once marks the beginning of Muslim separatism. However, Muslim separatism has a beginning uh, history, an initial history that explains both the attitudes to separatism. You see, it is a temporary strategic measure. The goal remains the same, namely the Islamization of whatever territory you are concerned with. So the Islamization of Mecca had escaped Muhammad. He had not been a success there as a, a beginning cult leader. But he remained intent on Islamizing Mecca, and ultimately he did. And his, uh, his emigration was a part of that strategy. So modernist Muslims, like the Aligarh school, 
they were familiar with modern notions like democracy. And so they understood the value of numbers. And they thought that as a minority of then 24%, they could not pull it off to rule India against 76%. So provisionally, they settled for Pakistan, just like Mohammed had settled for Medina, in the hope of using that as a launching pad for ultimately Islamizing the whole of India. By contrast, the traditionalist Muslims, they wanted immediate Islamization of India. And yes, they knew, of course, this, this uh, numerical problem that they were only a minority, but then the medieval conquerors of India were in an even smaller minority, and still they had ruled India. So why not? And anyway, even within united India, they knew that they would be pampered by the likes of Jawaharlal Nehru and other Congress leaders, and they could uh, strategize to this effect that they would become the ma majority, partly also by larger birth uh, figures and simply by conversion. So from 24 to 50 percent is not such a huge leap, so they counted on pulling that off. Anyway, so these are two strategies with the same goal, uh, Mohammed Ali Jinnah and uh, Maulana Azad had the same goal in mind, only their strategy was different. This is Mohammed Ali Jinnah, a um, westernized lawyer, and who had been a former Congress leader. He had opposed the Khilafat agitation. He predicted mayhem. You see, again, he was a modern lawyer. He wanted to do it in a civilized, formally correct manner. He wanted to advance the cause of India, but not with these uh, street tactics. You know, uh, appealing to the masses, in his opinion, that was going to lead to trouble, which it did. However, he was humiliated by Mahatma Gandhi. And here you see that the word Mahatma is perhaps not so innocent. You see, on the stage he stood there arguing against the points made by Gandhi, and he was interrupted by the public. And they shouted that he should not say Mr. Gandhi, he should say Mahatma Gandhi, which Jinnah refused. And so then they shouted him down, they booed him off the stage. Jinnah retired, Jinnah left politics, came back as a changed man. And precisely those forces that Gandhi had awakened Precisely those forces would become the mainstay of his campaign for partition. He um, returned as the leader of a Muslim community claiming separate statehood, which they had not done during the Khilafat agitation. He rejected minority status in a multicultural society, so he wanted to separate from the Hindus. And he argued that Indian Muslims had all the characteristics of a separate nation. You know, they used the separate language, they had a separate cuisine, separate clothes, and so on. So, separate nation. And so, separate state. The Muslim masses were initially not inclined to support this rather ambitious plan, but he won them over by violence. You see, if the Muslims inflicted violence on the Hindus, the Hindus were sure to react, and then the Muslims would all feel unsafe, and so then they would all clamor for a separate state. And indeed, in the 1945 elections, 86% of the Muslim electorate chose the Muslim League and its one-point program of partition. Now, some people make a lot of the personal circumstances of Jinnah. They say that, you see, if Gandhi had treated him better during the Khilafat uh, debates, then he would have evolved differently. That is quite possible. At the same time, not too much should be made of it, because he didn't invent the idea of partition. It was already there before, and then he became its leader later on. 
Also, there are many gossip books uh, imagining what would have happened if the British, uh, the Viceroy Louis Mountbatten, as well as the Congress leadership, had known about his terminal medical condition. He had a lung disease, of which indeed he died soon after achieving the partition. So if they had dragged out the talks a bit longer, maybe Jinnah would have fallen away and partition could have been averted. Well, I am not so sure. Again, by that time, the partition idea had gained a lot of momentum. You see, in most parties, if a leader dies, what happens is simply that the next man is elected. And then the, the same policies continue. So this is a more likely scenario than that the death of Jinnah would have changed anything meaningful. Now, as an example of a so-called nationalist Muslim, uh, which really means only a Congressite Muslim, we have Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. He um, issued a fatwa during the Khilafat agitation for the emigration of Muslims. You see, he decided that because of their uh, military confrontation with the Caliphate, the British were an enemy nation, and therefore the British Empire was enemy territory. Indian Muslims therefore should either oppose it militarily, which is what the, the Moplas in Kerala were doing, or they should leave. And so thousands of people sold everything, packed up their bags, went to Afghanistan, and then found that there was nothing for them there. So they had lost everything, and yet they had to come back to India. Uh, Azad was never taken to task for inflicting this misery, not even upon the enemy, but upon his own Muslim community. But anyway, that, you know, to us, to reasonable people, gives an idea of what Azad stood for. Nevertheless, he became Congress president later on. In fact, during the crucial years of the Second World War. And um, he arranged with Mahatma Gandhi to avert partition, which was then a, an imminent threat, to avert partition, because both of them didn't want partition. Gandhi didn't want partition for obvious reasons, for keeping India together. And uh, Azad didn't want partition because he wasn't satisfied with just a part of India. He wanted all of India to be Islamized. So both of them wanted to avert partition and they tried to do that by transferring power from the British to the Muslim League exclusively. So all ministerial posts would go to Muslim League members. Now, in Congress there were of course many people who wanted to avoid partition at any price, then again being denied the uh, favor of becoming ministers in the first cabinet of independent India, that was too much for them. So Congress refused this plan. But again, you see, it says you something about uh, Maulana Azad, who saw a beautiful opportunity of Islamizing the whole of India with which Gandhi cooperated. After independence, Maulana Azad stayed on in India to mold the Indian minds in his uh, function of uh, education minister. Okay, back to the partition. Was there a British hand behind the partition? Very many Hindus say so and believe so. It's very popular among Hindus because it bespeaks their anti-Western feelings, but especially their anti-anti-Islamism. They don't want to blame Islam for anything, not even for the partition. Which is a very comfortable idea, you know, that you know, this, this enemy we might be having here inside India, growing again, uh, is not to blame. You see, they can be trusted, they wouldn't want anything ugly like a partition. And yet, the documents show that the British opposed the partition effectively till March uh, 1947, when the last Viceroy came to power, Louis Mountbatten. 
uh, of uh, the third last Lord Linlithgow, we know that he told Gina to his face, we will never countenance partition. Of uh, Lord Wavell, the second last, there are a few times when he taunted Congress leaders. Ah, you claim to represent India. Well, look at the partition plan of the Muslim League. Now, if you cut and paste these sentences, you quote them out of context, you might create the impression that he was in favor of partition. Anyway, he or even he came much later than the partition resolution by the Muslim League. Even he had not created it. You see, the British faced the fact of a desire for partition among a large part of their population, and they defined their policy in those terms. So initially, they kept on opposing partition. Later on, after the war, after especially the beginning of the Cold War, the international circumstances had changed. And it would be profitable if the subcontinent was divided in two, because one of them would drift towards the Soviet bloc and the other automatically towards the Western bloc. So that could be then used to contain the expanding power of Russia and ultimately also of China. Also, the British were influenced by the mounting pressure through the form of violence. See, later on, they could have averted the enormous violence of the partition to a large extent by involving themselves, by remaining militarily active until the partition was over. Uh, so that they failed to do. In that sense, they have a certain guilt upon them. But it is not true that they themselves wished for the partition, but they were pressured by circumstances and especially by the violence launched by the Muslim League, who all the time knew what they wanted. When the British started collaborating with the plan for partition, they were in fact behind on some non-Muslims who had already accepted the partition before. In 1940 itself, just after the partition resolution by the Muslim League, Dr. Ambedkar, leader of the uh, Untouchables, welcomed the partition plan. He not just acquiesced in it, he said, but come to mention it, this partition is just what we need. You see, he thought, well, we cannot live with them. You know, it is best for everyone that Muslims and non-Muslims separate. And so, all non-Muslims, including the Dalits, or Harijans as they were then called, uh, he called on them to come to India immediately. And who would then clean the streets and the lavatories of the Pakistani Muslims, they would have to see for themselves, because the Dalits were no longer going to do it. Anyway, he took this idea very seriously. He worked out plans to, for example, exchange pension rights between those who stayed behind in India, those who went over to Pakistan, or the reverse. So he really took this seriously, and in fact it would have been a great way to avoid all the violence that has accompanied the partition. Anyway, uh, Nehru and Gandhi were dead against this idea. They would not accept the partition, and then when the partition came, they were not ready for it, and they made it much worse than it should have been. Besides Tenerit Ambedkar, who of course was not a freedom fighter, he was a member of the cabinet of the Viceroy. He was very much a collaborator with the British, but anyway, he was an important politician. And so he already, as a non-Muslim, thought that this Muslim plan for partition was a good idea. The Congress, of course, was still formally opposed to partition, but one after another, Congress leaders also started walking over to the other side and accepting partition, not really as a good thing, but at least as the lesser evil. They thought if the Muslims remain in India, it's going to be endless trouble, it's never going to stop, so it is best to put an end to it by separating. For example, Raja Gopalachari, for example, uh, the uh, Janata Prime Minister, um, Morarji Desai, 
And um, so, and then Nehru, of course, was effectively, he was not speaking out on it, but he was effectively preparing for a partition in India by his uh, friendship and close cooperation with Lord Mountbatten. Then, finally, Mahatma Gandhi also gave in. Gandhi had earlier promised the Hindus in the PAC designated territories in West Punjab, in Sindh, in East Bengal, that partition would never happen, that it could only happen over his dead body. Now, if Mahatma Gandhi said so, that carried some weight. Not only was he the tallest leader at that moment, he also had proven that he would indeed stake his life. He had already fasted unto death 16 times, every time the other party had given in. Now this time, that the Muslim League would give in was not so sure. Here he would really stake his life. It could really end with him dying. And he didn't try. He didn't stake his life. He buckled under and he even started whitewashing the partition, saying, oh yeah, but India is a joint account, and if some members want to leave, what can we do? Even though in his career he had many times forced people to do things that they didn't want to do. In fact, that's what this fast unto death was all about, was to create intense pressure on someone to make him do what he didn't want to do. Well, try it on Jinnah. Everybody said, well, this is the occasion to do it. And he didn't. So he abandoned the minorities in the Pakistani earmarked territories who had counted on him. Now, that perhaps was a uh, political necessity, who knows. But what was not forgivable anymore, in my opinion, was his attitude to the partition violence when it actually started taking place on a large scale. Many refugees came from West Punjab into Delhi and they were greeted by a Gandhi who told them to go back. He said it is better to die in your own place than fleeing. And after all, he said, it's not really bad to die it is, after all, only our Muslim brothers who are killing us. So it's not a bad thing. Well, I don't know what Indians think about this. You see, in a, in a very common book about Gandhi, namely Freedom at Midnight by uh, Collins and Lapierre, a number of these quotations are openly given of Gandhi telling these West Punjabi refugees go back. Better to get killed than to flee. Often people who had lost their whole families. Like for instance, one of the conspirators in the Mahatma Gandhi murder, Madan Lal Pahwa, had fled from West Pakistan with his whole family. His whole family had taken the train, but his aunt had insisted on going on foot to the border. And, you know, as, a, as an old woman alone, she would be very vulnerable. So her young nephew went with her. Now, the only reason why Madan Lal Pahwa made it to India is that he did not board that train because this whole train was massacred. So people with stories like that poured into Delhi. They had lost everything. And then the great apostle of peace tells them, oh, go back and get killed as well. So that is, um, that is much to take. There is also his famous advice to women who get raped, that it is best to cooperate. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. But, you know, to hear Gandhi say that of all people, I would think twice. So... Gandhi's major claim to fame, namely his technique of nonviolence, that had originated as a strategy for the weak to somehow defeat the strong, to talk to their conscience and make them think again, that had 
transformed into something very different, namely a form of cooperation with the strong of just giving in to the aggressor and then strike a high moral pose even though you are committing suicide. So that was a very perverted notion of nonviolence. And even if the earlier acts of nonviolence, you know, they were not just good as a story for American journalists who built up Gandhi, who gave him his image, uh, maybe they were indeed effective. But, you know, at the end, 1947, they were just the opposite. So, a few people uh, joined hands and decided that an end has to be put to Gandhi's life. The trigger that made them decide so was a fast unto death by Gandhi in order to force the Indian government to clear a certain financial debt that they have with the Pakistani government. The Pakistani government that was at that time patronizing a military intrusion into Kashmir and was claiming Kashmir from India. Kashmir that had by then already joined India formally, that had signed the instrument of accession. So you see this he thought really, this uh, Naturam Godse as well as his friends thought was really out of bounds, was really too much. And so he decided, you see, the life of this man has to be stopped. Also, there were other problems coming up where he foresaw that Gandhi's role would be very negative. Like there was the question of the inclusion of the state of the Nizam in Hyderabad, where it was very probable that the expected military action to include uh, Hyderabad into India would be thwarted by Gandhi in a similar way as he thwarted the, uh, well, let's say, punishment by India of Pakistan for their intrusion in Kashmir. So he thought, you see, it is the best for everyone if Gandhi disappears right now. This, uh, the effective murder took place on 30 January 1948. But a week earlier, there had been a first attempt where a handful of conspirators had arranged a plan to do the killing. A certain role was assigned to Digambar Badhe, who would stand outside and give a warning sign. But he had developed cold feet, and the whole plan had broken down, and Badhe himself was arrested. The others could escape. But they feared that Badhe would talk to the police, perhaps under torture, and so the time that they still had to uh, make good on their plan was limited. So God say, dispensed with all the plans and said, you see, I will act on my own. And he went there with a the pistol and then while greeting Gandhi, he shot him. He himself denied afterwards that Gandhi had said, hey, Ram as he said on his uh, monument in Delhi, and as everybody has all the biographies and so on say. But, you know, that is not an important point. And so, immediately after that, he himself was arrested. In fact, he didn't try to escape. And um, then several others that already the police uh, was on the trail of were also arrested. Vir Savarkar, the political leader, was not involved, and this also turned out later during the trial, but he was arrested nonetheless, and reportedly under the instruction of Prime Minister Nehru himself. So a trial took place in which Naturam Godse uh, stated his reasons for doing this, a uh, speech that didn't save him, but that made a lot of difference for the others. He emphasized that he had acted on his own, that the others were not involved. So it still remains a bit blurred to what extent exactly they had been involved. At any rate, uh, only he and his closest friend Narayan Apte 
were sentenced to death and effectively hanged. Savarkar and two others were released for lack of evidence. And three others were sentenced to prison, among them the brother of the uh, assassin, Gopal Godse, and this refugee, Madan Lal Pahwa. The consequences of the murder. Now, to preempt a communal flare-up, even before it was clear who had committed the murder, state radio announced that the murderer had been a Hindu, which turned out to be true. But at any rate, they would have said that because the other scenario would have been an enormous anger against the Muslims and a massacre of many Muslims. Um, in fact, Godse had thought at first of arranging the murder in such a way that the popular anger would turn against the Muslims. You see, the, he had a complex uh, plan. One of the conspirators would get circumcised beforehand. He would, in view of everyone, kill the Mahatma, and then one of the other conspirators would kill him. Now, before the police would find out his name and so on, and the fact that he was not a Muslim, popular anger would already have flared up, and many, many Muslims would have been killed, and many more would have packed up and tried to get to Pakistan. So that was, that was the plan, in fact. Uh, but, you know, because of pressing time, it had to become simpler and then it was just the murder. Now, what happened more? Um, there was a, an outburst of violence against the Hindu Mahasabha offices and against the RSS offices and against many individuals identified with those organizations. For example, the brother of uh, Veer Savarkar. Hundreds of Maharashtri and Brahmins were murdered, were killed. You see, this was a phenomenon very similar to the murder of thousands of Sikhs after the murder of Indira Gandhi in 1984. You know, one Sikh had killed her and therefore the whole Sikh community had to pay. You know, that was Congress secularism in practice. So in 1948, a similar thing happened. It was mo mostly the caste of Godse himself, the Chitpawan Brahmins who suffered, the Brahmins in general to some extent. But that phenomenon was confined to Maharashtra. And apparently it, um, it was rooted in the ancient rivalry between the Marathas, uh, to which Shivaji Bhonsle had belonged the great freedom fighter against Aurangzeb. And then the Chitpawan Brahmins who um, had been or, or were associated with the Chitpawan uh, family of the Peshwas, the prime ministers originally of Shivaji Bhonsle and his descendants, who had taken over the Maratha Empire. So there was a rivalry between those two more generally the, the middle castes and the, the Brahmin castes together. So that uh, rivalry found its expression now that they had the uh, occasion of uh, stealing a march behind the anger about Gandhi's murder to, um, well, uh, take revenge on the whole Chitpawan caste. And then, of course, there was a police crackdown on the Hindu Mahasabha and on the RSS. The Hindu Mahasabha was completely marginalized um, because, of course, it was deemed guilty as a whole. Now, I think that the um, Hindu Mahasabha as a whole was not guilty. One of its members had decided to act. A political party as a whole had no reason to commit such a thing because they knew what effectively happened later on, namely that the party as such was punished. So they had every reason to behave more normally, especially because the future was shining upon them. 
You see, they had been proven right with the partition. Independence had not gone the way that the original freedom fighters had wanted. And so they had been proven correct that that could be an asset for the future. But that was completely thrown away with the assassination. So the um, Hindu Mahasabha was effectively marginalized. Its, its only stronghold remained Gorakhpur, where um, the last uh, Hindu Mahasabha member of parliament was in fact the guru of the guru of the present chief minister of that state, Uddhar Pradesh, namely another monk from Gorakhpur, uh, Yogi Adityanath, who had also for a long time been the member of parliament for Gorakhpur. But even there, uh, you see that that political clan has moved over to the Bharatiya Janata Party, abandoning the Hindu Mahasabha. So effectively, the Hindu Mahasabha still exists in the sense that it still has a party headquarters, but otherwise it doesn't represent much. The president of the party even defected immediately after the murder. He did not want to be associated with it, namely a staunch Hindu, nevertheless, Shyam Prasad Mukherjee. He was even a minister in the first cabinet of Nehru, which was a, a pan-party uh, cabinet. Uh, so he left the Hindu Mahasabha and he founded a new party in the uh, context of the uh, RSS. The RSS was setting up a whole network of organizations. It ended up with its own student organization, its own trade union, its own women's organization and so on. So among those was also a political party. The leader of the RSS, we're going to discuss him in a minute, uh, did not believe very much in politics, but in his own words, a house also needs a lavatory. And so therefore, his own network was going to contain also a political party. Now of that party, the Jan Sang, this Mukherjee became the first president. He remained a staunch Hindu activist, particularly campaigning against the Muslim separatism in the state of Kashmir. And uh, because of this, he entered Kashmir, was imprisoned there and died in prison. Now, as a staunch Hindu, who, he would probably not recognize today's BJP. And this is because of another consequence of the murder. The RSS and its network of organizations, even those organizations yet to be founded, suffered a certain ideological effect of the murder, which meant a continuous weakening on the ideological side. The leader of the RSS at that point, after Hedgevar's death, was Madhav Sadashiv Golwalkar, since he had been a professor for a while, he was called Guruji. Now, this Guruji, in fact, made it clear that the RSS had nothing to do with the murder. Immediately after the murder, he publicly stated that it had been a heinous crime. He showed no sympathy at all for uh, the murder and, the, and those who sympathized openly with the murder. Nevertheless, there was a crackdown on the RSS. For example, all its publications uh, were impounded. There is a famous book by uh, Golwalkar called We Our Nationhood Defined, written in 1938. And so in 1947, its fourth and final edition was confiscated and it never appeared again. So nowadays you see leftist critics try to associate the RSS with that book. In fact, 99.9% .9 of RSS men have never seen the book. Anyway, um, so it was a big blow for the RSS. It uh, was forced to draw up a constitution, which was from a national viewpoint acceptable, and then allowed to function again. But even though numerically it, it grew enormously and, and created many organizations in many fields, 
ideologically it became weaker and weaker, less Hindu, less an enemy of the secular state that had been declared. Like, for example, when the historian Sitaram Goel wrote a series of articles criticizing Nehru and initially agreeing with the editor of Organizer, the RSS paper, to publish it there, the top ranks of the RSS intervened to stop the publication because they said, well, if anything happens to Nehru, we are going to get the blame just like happens, happened in the, in the Gandhi assassination. So we should avoid this criticism. Now, if it was simply a policy matter of not publishing this critique of Nehru, that could still be understood. But what happened effectively is that they also interiorized the rejection of this critique, that they, become, that they became more Nehruvian, less pro-Hindu. And this process has continued till today. So that, you know, the policies of today's Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the reconstitution of the old Jan Sang, would be completely strange and bizarre and, and weak and up for criticism by Shyama Prasad Mukherjee or other uh, Jan Sang uh, leaders of the beginning. There was a lot of criticism of Gandhi during his life. And in fact, during his speech in court, uh, Godse made that critique his own. Uh, many of the politicians who had to deal with the, him, both British and fellow congressmen and uh, Muslim League men, thought him old and irrational. Even apart from the actual viewpoints that he took, they thought his whole approach to uh, politics was a bit misguided. Then um, Sarojini Naidu said, and many others have confirmed or have spoken in the same sense, it costs a lot to make Gandhi live in poverty. You see, I thought he was a great poser, and uh, he could come across as very profound and many other good things, but in fact, you see, he was, uh, he was, incre he was not credible. He was not authentic. Then he mixed religion and politics. That very much he did. You see, he made public policy a, a sort of act of moral testing of yourself, a form of, of abstinence, of asceticism. And conversely, he made religious acts politically relevant. And um, even worse, he clearly came across as a Hindu. You see, even though he spoke in favor of Islam, of Christianity, many times pushed decisions that were harmful to Hinduism, nevertheless, his imagery was totally Hindu. And so that is perhaps what, what after his death, became one of his greatest sins. You see, the communist leader Ashok Mitra, for example, has called Gandhi the original sinner of communalism. In uh, non-violence, he was obviously an extremist who had no power of discrimination. You see, sometimes there is an economy of violence where a little bit of violence can save you far bigger violence. Like if the Muslim League's violence for partition had been put down, all the partition massacres could have been prevented. I agree it is easy to say that afterwards, but then even before partition, some politicians had warned for such a scenario, including Jinnah himself in 1920 in this Congress meeting where he was humiliated by Gandhi. He was also politically whimsical. For example, he led this campaign for complete independence, but suddenly ended it after an agree with Lord Irwin without uh, any meaningful result which means that he abandoned the thousands and thousands of activists who had given up their jobs or their studies in order to join Gandhi's campaign. I am also reminded of the communist uh, slogan about him. 
He was the cleverest bourgeois scoundrel. Similar criticisms with a different emphasis were um, formulated after his death. Or you see one that was formulated already at the time, but that has recently become very, very noisy, is that he was soft as well as confused about caste. You see the, um, the former untouchables who were more or less under his care while he was alive have politically emancipated, have started their own movement, call themselves Dalits instead of Harijans, and they don't like Gandhi at all because what they want is full equality and what Gandhi was giving them was something else. Gandhi was an autocrat within Congress. He forced the rest of the party to toe his line. Though, of course, you could say if they had had more backbone, they could have opposed him. Who knows? He was a family tyrant. He was anything but a feminist. So according to the very, very modern uh, norms, he was out of it. He was not an anti-racist also. You see, he, um, he campaigned against colonialism. But if you look at the details, uh, in South Africa, for example, he did not campaign for equality. He campaigned for a betterment for the Indian community, which means that he accepted the steep inequality between white and black, only he wanted Indians to be recognized as white rather than as black. And that's something else. And so many of the stereotypes which colonial Europeans used to have about blacks, he shared. He thought that they were indolent and, you see, not interested in, in working, in, in, they had no ambition and so on, that they were fit for being, if not slaves, at least underlings. Now, defenders of Gandhi said that later on he evolved. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, you see, he was not, by modern standards, an anti-racist, which is why recently in Ghana, in a university, they removed the statue of Gandhi. And then, in making Nehru his political heir, in making sure that not Sardar Patel, but Jawaharlal Nehru became Congress leader at the time of independence, and thus the first head of government, he was in fact the murderer of Gandhism. Everything that he stood for in politics was negated by Nehru. And he brought Nehru to power. For example, he believed in this <coughs> spinning wheel, whereas Nehru believed in industrialization. And what India opted for was industrialization. So that is not in spite of Gandhi. That was ultimately engineered by Gandhi. Then, and then perhaps the reason why foreigners consider Gandhi a saint, but Hindus, except for politicians, but Hindus in general do not consider him a saint, is that he didn't behave like a saint. You see, in some, some opportunities for the camera, he put on saintly airs, but in fact, he talked a lot about himself, which is not what a saint is supposed to do. In India, a sannyasin talks uh, only about his life after his ordination as a sannyasin. What happened before all goes, uh, all disappears. He never talks about himself. He doesn't use his own old name, his, old, his own civil name. He doesn't mention his caste identity, his birthplace, his family, and so on. All that has died. Now, in the case of Gandhi, by contrast, there is hardly anyone in world history who has written more about himself than he. And he, even all kinds of funny details about his personal hygiene, he used to talk about to his, to his own uh, companions every morning. So that self-obsession was anything but saintly. Then he um, fasted 70 times unto death, but ultimately it took a bullet to get him dead. 
So, not that I think that this bullet was a good thing, but nevertheless, you can't miss seeing this, this contradiction of his heirs of uh, staking his life and then his refusal finally to stake his life so that somebody else could take it. And then perhaps worst of all, he swore by Ram Rajya. He was also for a Hindu state. So after his death, some people have become very explicit in their criticism. For example, Baal Thakre, he was the president of the Shiv Sena, which is a local uh, party of the middle castes of Maharashtra, sons of the soil, against Bihari immigrants, against Gujarati money bags, against the local Brahmins also. But nevertheless, a very Hindu party that uh, celebrates Shiva Jeev Honsle, uh, who was the anti-Muslim leader during the Mughal period. Now, as we already saw, these middle castes in Maharashtra have their own historical rivalry with the Chitpavan Brahmins. But setting aside that rivalry, <coughs> uh, Baltake could nonetheless praise Naturam Godse, and he even said, in the future, people will not build statues for Mahatma Gandhi, but for Naturam Godse. And speaking of statues, many Gandhi statues have already been vandalized by the Dalit movement, who call themselves Ambedkarites. Ambedkar was a very sharp leader of the Harijans or Dalits in his own day. He was not very popular. But after his death, he has become popular. And now, of course, India is very well adorned with statues for Dr. Ambedkar, as well as for his own political follower, uh, Mayawati, the, who has been the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, and who has adorned every square in her province with her own statues. But so those same people have very much expressed their anger against Gandhi, their disavowal of the Gandhian heritage by vandalizing Gandhi statues. Then on the other hand, some people have admitted the criticism of Gandhi, but have nevertheless defended him in broad outline. Take for instance Ram Swarup. He was a Gandhian activist in his young days. He later turned to the left, then disappointed with the left, he became an anti-communist. And he wrote several books in which he compared the Gandhian approach with the communist approach. Books like Gandhism and Communism and Gandhian Economics. So then later he became a Hindu activist rather than a Gandhian activist and an ideologue of the Hindu and pagan and neo-pagan alliance seeking the roots of pre-Christian and pre-Islamic <coughs> religions. <coughs> He uh, was the secretary of Gandhi's associate in his later life, uh, Madeleine Slade. And uh, it was in that phase of his life, which is shortly after the murder, that he explained that, you know, a murder is not, of course, a good thing in itself. But in a sense, it is fitting for a great figure, for a great and controversial figure who did not shun controversy. You see, whatever criticism you can give of Gandhi, he certainly was a heroic figure in a sense, and he eagerly risked controversy. So for him, for that kind of man, it would not even be fitting to die in his bed. So in a sense, whatever is wrong with the murder, it was an appropriate kind of death for such a towering figure. And finally, I mentioned Sitaram Goel. He was also a Gandhian activist in his young days, uh, particularly uh, concerning the uh, struggle for the rights of the um, sweeper caste, which was a caste very close to Gandhi's heart. He became a communist, then an anti-communist, and he pioneered uh, a think tank devoted precisely to exposing the truth about communism, 
namely the Society for the Defense of Freedom in Asia. He was a Swatantra party candidate. Swatantra was a sort of liberal pro-Western anti-communist party uh, in 1957. And he ended up again as a, a reborn Hindu and founded the pro-Hindu publishing house Biblia Impex, which published several pro-Gandhian books. I say all this because I want to put in context his own um, or part of his own final judgment about Gandhi. Confronting the uh, common Hindu to a claim that uh, Gandhi was guilty of many things, including the creation of Pakistan, and that otherwise he was a soft brain who misjudged many important issues, he put that criticism to rest. He says Gandhi's mistakes were Hindu society's mistakes. Gandhi did not stood out very far from Hindu society. And the, the explanations he gave for problems like the communal problem were not very far from the explanations thought up by the common Hindu. And it is precisely for that reason that they were so popular, that they so eagerly found an audience. So he shared his mistakes with many. And any criticism of Gandhi should, in fact, be a criticism of the mentality of the common, of the average Hindu. So those are some uh, observations about the Mahatma Gandhi murder, about its background and its consequences. Thank you.